Cheryl Kaiser. I'm the Associate Chair for Research of the Psychology Department, and I have the distinct honor of welcoming you to our 2016 Alan Edwards Public Lecture Series. I'm pleased you could join the Psychology Department as we celebrate this year's lecture series, which is titled Connecting the Dots Between the Research and the Community. Tonight's lecture marks the close of our three-week series, which has explored how psychological science contributes towards addressing society's most important and pressing issues. Um, so before this evening's lecturers share their exciting research with you, I'll provide a few comments about how this series came about. This annual lecture series is the result of the generous support of Professor Alan L. Edwards, who made a substantial gift to establish an endowment that ensures that this series can take place free of charge to all of us. Professor Edwards was a member of our department for half a century, from his arrival in 1944 until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, teacher, researcher, and writer who was credited with changing the way psychological research is carried out by introducing modern statistical techniques to this field. His statistics books were long-standing gold standards for all of psychological research. The Edwards family contribution to the psychology department is an example of what can be accomplished with support from members of our community. Thank you to those of you in this room who are already supporters of our department. Your generosity is critical in creating opportunities for UW psychology to continue to address some of the important problems facing our nation and the world, as well as to support our undergraduate and graduate students. Um, without delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Wendy Stone. Dr. Stone received her PhD in psychology from the University of Miami. She's currently professor of psychology at UW and director for the Research and Early Autism Detection and Identification Lab, which has an acronym of the Ready Lab. She joined the UW after having spent the previous 20 years at Vanderbilt University. While at Vanderbilt, she founded and directed the Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders, which has a threefold mission of research and clinical service and community outreach. She served as the director of the UW Autism Center from 2010 to 2013, at which time she formed the Ready Lab to continue her research and outreach efforts. Dr. Stone's primary clinical and research interests are in early identification and early intervention for children with autism spectrum disorders. Her research focuses on identifying the early emerging behavioral features of autism with the goal of understanding the developmental processes that contribute to the tremendous variability in social learning and behavioral outcomes for these children and implementing interventions to optimize these outcomes. Dr. Stone has authored numerous papers on these topics, has been hugely successful in earning federal grant funding and foundation support for her research. Her research with young children led to the development of the screening tool for autism in two-year-olds and a book for parents called Does My Child Have Autism? She serves on the editorial boards of Autism Research in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders and has participated in numerous work groups and review panels for the National Institute of Health and many autism foundations. She serves on the Scientific Advisory Board for Autism Speaks and is on the Autism Advisory Panel for Sesame Street, where she was just instrumental in introducing one of their newest characters, Julie, a little girl with autism. And it's such an honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. Wendy Stone, to you this evening. Thank you, Cheryl, and thanks to all of you for being here. And I also want to extend thanks to Sherry, our department chair, for inviting me, and Dana and Sarah for all the logistical coordination they were doing for this. So the, the title of this and the overarching theme of the two presentations today, I should say I'm also delighted that David Mandel has agreed to join me uh, in co-presenting. And um, although he promised to spar with me, I also made him promise not to ask any questions. <laughs> because his questions are always very hard. <laughs> so the theme is connecting the dots from research to the community. And we all know how research works, right? So somebody has a really, really important question, designs like the very perfect, beautifully designed experiment, and gets like a crazy wonderful new discovery. And then it's time to implement it in the community. 
So we, of course, the scientist assumes that, well, everybody's going to want it. This is a great thing. Everybody needs it. And, um, and those are the dots that are connected. The problem is it doesn't always take in the community. And the fact of the matter is that very few evidence-based practices are adopted in the community. And the ones that are can take 17 years to get there. So we have a, a situation here that both David and I are going to address. Um, we're going to talk about different ends of the age spectrum and also different um, modes of analysis. I, um, David works with big data sets from the state and from federal agencies, and I work with much smaller local data sets. Um, and what we, one thing that, is, that unites, many things unite our, our talks, but one is that it is very, um, the questions that we have, the, one of the reasons it doesn't, what we discover, wonderful as it is, why it doesn't translate into community practice, is that we may not be asking the right questions. And we may come up with answers that are just impossible, that, are don't, that don't align with the mission of the, of the community agency, that it doesn't align with the resources that the community agency has, and the question just may not be important. So we have learned that the, to ask an important question that's going to be for something that's going to be implemented in the community, we really need to get some input from the community. And so that's, that's I guess, a, a common theme between both of our talks. I'm going to talk about um, the very young age range and the importance of early detection of autism. And I kind of go, this is something very important and dear to me, so I, I can't not talk about it. Uh, I want to talk about current obstacles to early identification and early intervention. And then I'm going to talk about a new project that we have that's examining a different kind of healthcare delivery system that's designed to expedite access for very young children with or suspected of autism to appropriately specialized treatment services. I am going to say autism sometimes. Sometimes I'm going to say ASD. I doubt I'll say autism spectrum disorder because it's too hard to say. Uh, but so just know that I'm talking about the same thing if I say autism or ASD. Just uh, some fundamental background information um, that you probably already know, but um, autism is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder. It's present from early in life, but its development is really insidious. And by that, I mean that the symptoms develop gradually over time. Um, there are some peaks and troughs. It's an uneven pattern of development. Um, and then eventually, the symptoms reach a threshold at which their, a diagnosis can be made. Diagnosis is based on a pattern of impairment in two broad domains of behavior. And this is according to the latest version of the DSM-5, which is the, the Diagnostic Bible. One is impaired social communication and social interaction. And the other is restricted and repetitive behaviors or interests. Each of these domains can actually be seen in other conditions. Um, and it's only when the two of them come together that we're talking about a diagnosis of autism. One thing that you can, the most consistent thing about autism is the inconsistency across um, ch one child, from one child to another across children. It's characterized by extreme variability in symptom expression, and many people have started calling it the autisms. Each child expresses autism in a different way. The patterns develop, diff the symptoms develop differently. The symptoms can be expressed at different levels of severity. And, and um, there is that expression, if you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism. So early detection is really, really important for several reasons. The first is it is the golden ticket to specialized early intervention. And we have learned now, after I would say the last probably 15 years, that specialized early intervention is associated with significant gains in many areas of development. Social development, language development, cognitive development, behavioral functioning. And these gains, I can say, having come into this field a long, long time ago, these gains were not gains that we ever expected to see. Um, we were diagnosing children at, at four, and we were seeing mostly pretty severe children. And when we met with parents, we would say, your child has autism and will always have autism. And we see these, these younger children, we don't say that anymore. We say, well, your child right now meets the diagnostic criteria for autism, but let's get some specialized services and we'll, we'll revisit and see, see what happens. 
But the, and the coolest thing about this is that it suggests that the core features of autism are, are malleable and that we actually can change them. And that makes sense, really, from um, a neuroscience point of view in terms of the early years being a very important time for brain development. Um, lots of um, synapses are being formed. The brain is being, is being organized. And it's being organized based on early experiences. Um, our learning is dependent on, not just on what we come into the world with genetically, but also the types of experiences we have, especially when we're young, but not only when we're young. And they could be either positive or negative. And early experiences really, we believe now, change the architecture of the developing brain. And economic research, uh, as well as developmental research suggests that providing positive experiences early in life is not only more effective, but it's also less costly than trying to provide corrective intervention at later ages. So this is my silly little visual for that. Um, if we assume that this is how typical development progresses, so one block builds evenly on top of another block, there's a very solid foundation, it's a nice straight line. This is what development might look like. Um, that when it's atypical and a child doesn't get intervention. Um, so it's not, the foundation may not be quite as solid, and there's a cascading, and there's an early difference from what we might call typical, and then that, that difference gets greater and greater over time because of the cascading effect of not having that, that core, de, de, core fundamental developmental skill or having less of it. So what we, you can see that it would be easier to intervene at this point when the distance isn't as far as it is here. So what we want to do with early intervention is when we start to see development differ, um, we want to intervene so that it can continue a more, a more straight course. Does that make sense? OK. So why specialized intervention? Why do these children need specialized intervention? Well. This pattern of characteristics of the, between the social challenges and the restricted behaviors and interests um, really present unique challenges in a learning situation. What they can mean is they translate into potentially, and when I say I'm never generalizing because children, again, are so different, but I'm going to talk in generalities. Um, some, I will try to use qualifiers, but if I don't, forgive me. And, Put them in yourselves in your head. So um, we see we can see less understanding of social cues, not understanding facial expressions, not understanding why you can't um, have the toy that another child has. We may ha see children who are less motivated by praise, so social rewards may not be enough or may not be meaningful for these children. We often see difficulties understand, not just understanding language, but not being able to use language, and not just being, not being able to use language, but not being able to communicate non-verbally either. Even little infants um, communicate non-verbally before they acquire language. They're able to, they use gestures, they point, they use facial expressions, they use eye contact, lots of different non-verbal ways to communicate. But these seem to be also very, very difficult for children with autism to to learn early on. And then just in a world where you can't, you're not necessarily understanding what people are saying to you, and you can't, you don't have good ways of letting people know what you want or need, can be very, very confusing and frustrating. And then these children also may have focused or repetitive interests, um, which may make it um, difficult um, when teaching play skills with another child, if a child wants to play with a toy in the same way, or difficulties with transitions if there's a change in a, in a classroom routine, or uh, moving from one classroom to another classroom. So there are lots of different, um, different potential behavioral implications that have a lot to do with teaching. So that means that we really need specialized approaches. So the general generic um, approaches to intervention with children with autism don't, they just don't work as well because they have these the special needs in all these different areas. So the kinds of things we have to do are, first of all, find activities that are motivating. If, if, um, if a high five or a good work or a smile um, isn't going to motivate a child to do what you want the child to do, then you've got to figure out ways. So the way that this dad figured out was, um, was swinging his child and, and bouncing him around. That was what this child liked most, and that was his, that was his reward. 
There, I know another set of parents who actually had the te got the teacher to do this, but the, he, they really liked, the child liked um, being pulled up by his ears off the floor, and that was something. But it works, it works. <laughs> Um, we also need to think about, okay, if children aren't understanding language, how do we help them understand what we want? And so using visual cues and visual supports is a really effective strategy. But again, this is something that not every teacher automatically knows. Um, these are, um, they're helpful for all children and adults. We all have our own visual reminders, but they're, they're needed um, for children, by children with autism. So this is a time timer which um, gives you a visual estimate of how much time is left to an activity um, that you may not want to be doing or until the activity that you really want to do. So when the red disappears, it's time. Um, there are first then boards that indicate visually, okay, you gotta get your hair washed, but after that we get to do something that you like, which is in this case singing Wheels on the Bus. Um, we need to give them ways to communicate. This is a choice board so that um, the child can indicate non-verbally which snack he wants. And then we also actually need to teach flexibility. And this is something that you don't often need to teach, but we need to teach children to adapt to changes in routines. Um, and this is just a, a visual schedule that helps us. Um, uh, we put a question mark in to get the child ready for the fact that what usually happens then isn't gonna happen and then um, can work through that. A second reason for that early detection is important is for family empowerment and family education. Par children with autism can be very confusing to parents and complicated to figure out. A lot of the time, they look like other kids. A lot of the time, they act like other kids. And it can be very confusing for parents to understand what's going on. So the, the important thing is to provide them with resources and networking and, uh, and probably that diagnostic label that can help them understand and give them strategies for working with their child and feeling more efficacious as parents. Um, when the child is not doing what you're wanting them to do, it's very easy to think that, oh, they're being non-compliant or they don't like me or I'm doing something wrong or they're evil. Um, and we want to pre prevent the development of those negative attributions. And then thirdly, we want to be able to understand the causes and, develop, and to develop tailored treatments. And, I, and it really helps to be able to study children young so we can I, I try to disentangle the, the early core features from the, the later emerging developmental sequelae that result from those early features. And um, by doing this, by, by learning about children when they're young, we, we hope to be able to identify developmental pathways and, and potentially different subtypes, behavioral subtypes of autism. And here's an example of, of, of what this can do. So if we assume that core social impairment is, um, is one of the major features of autism, there are a couple of things that could underlie it, this. So it could be that children with autism just, ha just aren't as motivated um, to interact, not as motivated to connect with people as other children are. Um, and there's some evidence in the literature suggesting that, yes, these children um, don't orient to people as much as they do to toys, um, or they, while they um, experience enjoyment, they don't share it with adults. They don't, they don't look to someone else and smile to let them know, oh, you know, this is, you know, I'm enjoying this, do more. Um, and then there's also evidence that the social reward systems in the brain are working differently in, in older children with autism. So those things might underlie the core social impairment. On the other hand, there could, and these are not mutually exclusive by any means, it could be that attentional and sensory processes are, are more involved in, the, um, in creating the social impairment. So we do know that children with autism have difficulty disengaging attention, shifting attention from one, from one focus to another focus. We know that they, um, older, for older children, they have difficulty um, binding information that comes in through the visual and auditory realms. And, um, and the reason that these may contribute to, to the social impairment is that the social, if you think about how social cues work and social understanding works, you really need to, to map, map face. The face moves very quickly. You really need to match um, facial expressions with what's said, with the eyes, with the context that's going around. And it's a, really a very complicated thing. And you just need to be able to um, shift attention, know what to attend to, 
and integrate these very quick language lip cues. Now, these would have different, um, different implications for intervention. So if it's social motivation, then you want to develop strategies to enhance um, the reward, reward properties of people. You want to make yourself fun as a person um, and, and pair other kinds of rewards with that social reward. And, and, and if it's attentional and social, then we want to develop strategies um, that can help children integrate visual and social or visual and auditory information so that it's easier to process social cues. So that's how, how why it's important to understand um, what is underlying the, the, the challenges. There, have, there are lots of different practice guidelines from different professional organizations that advocate early detection and intervention. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, in, in particular, has been very uh, active in um, promoting screening as early as autism-specific screening as early as 18 months, and providing many different toolkits for, um, for primary care providers to use. All right, so there are lots of reasons that early detection is important. There are lots of practice parameters that suggest that we should be doing it. So how are we doing? How are we doing with early detection? Well, the average age at which parents become concerned about their child's development um, these are parents who later have um, are found to have a child with autism, although autism may not be the initial concern, is 18, 17 to 18 months. And this is the most replicated re research finding in the literature. This is like the only one that you can find in like 10 different articles when parents talk about when they first started worrying. The age at which children average age at which children receive a definitive ASD diagnosis is somewhere between three and a half and four and a half. I can't, I don't have the heart to change this slide, but it changes a little bit here, a little bit with the, when new estimates come out. And then if, if the child happens to be from a minority background, it's two years later than that. So um, this is a huge gap, be, I shouldn't say that word. It's a very large gap between concerns and diagnosis. And this is a very, very, very frustrating time for parents. Um, they're worried about their child, they're wondering what's going on with their child, and yet they can't, they can't get an answer. Um, and even worse is that they don't, they're missing out on this, um, this period of time where they can receive state and federal funded um, Part C in early intervention services. So it's, a, it's a, a loss for all to not be able to identify them. And I say this very keenly aware of the many obstacles that there are to making um, an early diagnosis. And one is that it's just, it's just hard. Um, the diagnosis of aut autism is behaviorally based. We don't have any medical markers. We don't have any biological markers. We can't go to the doctor and say, can you test me? We can't get a genetic analysis and um, get a definitive answer about yes, autism, or no autism. What we do instead is we re rely on a pattern of behavioral sy symptoms um, from the DSM-5 that we observe, and we, um, we observe and we talk to, to caregivers um, to formulate the diagnosis. But behavioral symptoms vary across children, and they also vary across time in the same child. And the younger we try to go in making an early diagnosis, the, the more challenging it is, um, because as you all know, um, children who are younger have uh, a lot more behavioral variability. They're less um, regulated emotionally and behaviorally. So for infants, um, you, like, why is this infant crying? What is typical? Is it typical to cry then? Uh, we, don't real, there's, we don't really know. Is, is, she, is she wet? Is she um, hungry? Is she, did she get stung by a bee? We just don't know exactly why she's crying, so we have to try to, try to figure that out. Um, then there's the terrible twos. I mean, this is where behavioral dysregulation is the norm. I mean, we expect kids to act out when they're two, to have temper tantrums. So it gets, it gets really hard sometimes to, to judge what is, um, as you're going to hear um, from this parent. We were um, very fortunate to be able to get funding from the state through a, a grant from the Attorney General's office. It's called the ASAP grant. And it was um, to provide training to um, early childhood providers throughout the state. So through that, we, um, 
through that, we were able to make a, a video for parents. And it is on our website, if any of you are interested. It's called Understanding Autism Perspectives from Parents and, Profe and Providers or Professionals, or something like that. So here's a parent who describes it's really not a his, it's a her, as you will see, her viewpoint. I have a hard time, since my son's only five right now, um, seeing what's the toddler and what's the autism. And where do these overlap? Or what is just being a boy and the autism? I do have a tough time with that sometimes. Okay. So another, does that make sense? Is that, is that does, or does, do any of you have children with autism? or? Do any of you know children with autism? <laughs> you know, if I asked that question 20 years ago, you know how many people would raise their hands? This is three, maybe. OK. So um, another challenge is that we, as a culture, and I don't think we're alone in this, have, have, don't have good expectations or norms for typical social milestones or what social reciprocity is. We know when children are supposed to walk, we know when they're supposed to talk, but you know, when are they supposed to smile back at you? And what percent of time are they supposed to smile back at you? Or when are they supposed to imitate your actions spontaneously? And how often are they supposed to do that? And when are they supposed to look at you when you call their name? I mean, we just, we don't have, we don't have norms for that. And that makes it a bit challenge, challenging. And then parents are very, very clever. And they figure out ways to get the best out of their children. They figure out ways to get their child to look at them and to get their child to communicate with them. And some parents really do not realize how hard they have to work. And that it usually isn't that hard, because other children just have, have, seem to have that natural instinct to interact and communicate. And so this is a parent who, um, w this is a, the child just liked to be, you know, he, this was something he liked to do, is be swung on her legs. And through this routine, um, he, would, he learned to look at her and request it, that she continue the routine. Um, and so he learned to communicate this way. Also, I know I keep talking about the challenges of early diagnosis, but, um, but there are a lot. And I, I don't want people to think that it's, it's an easy thing. I've been doing this for like, I don't know, too long to say. And I, can, I will say, though, that I, you know, with young children, I, I hardly ever feel 100% confident in a, in a diagnosis. It just isn't, it doesn't work that way. And I always like for parents to, to revisit the question. Anyway, so if this is um, how, if skills develop in this vertical fashion and um, chronological age advances this way, this line would reflect a, a typical learning. So you're, you're doing a, getting a month's worth of learning for a month's worth of age. So some children with autism show a pattern where they seem to be developing typically, and then they kind of level off. So there's a, just more of a discrepancy between what their peers are doing and what they're doing. Other children seem to develop typically, and then they actually have a loss of skills or, or some regression. And then other children just seem to have some, some delays from almost, some, almost day one. So if you're trying to identify what's, auto, what's autism and, and what isn't, at this young age here, um, there isn't that much difference between the children with autism and, and without. And it's much easier at this age um, because there's more of a difference between the behaviors. Um, so that's one more challenge. I think I only have one more challenge to tell you about, which is that. Social and communication impairments, which are critical for the diagnosis, are actually negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are the things that you see. You see hand flapping, you see a child running around, you see a tantrum. Positive symptoms are social, uh, negative symptoms are like social and communication impairments are things that you, you don't see enough of. They're expected behaviors that you just, that you're not, you're, you're not seeing or you're not seeing enough of. And, um, and they're much harder to see because we, we, it's, again, it's hard to judge. If we don't see something in one situation, well, is it because the child's hungry or tired or it's a new situation? So we can, it's easy to make attributions for why that behavior isn't showing up. But the behaviors we expect to see are social engagement, social interaction, reciprocity, interest in peers. This is by 18 months. We expect to see um, children spontaneously imitating the actions of their parents. Um, this child puts a bunch of stickers on his chest and is like proudly showing off to his parents um, for attention, nothing but attention. Um, using gestures to communicate. Um, this child is, is pointing to, to show it. 
something to his mom. This other child is holding up an Easter egg that he found. And then facial expressions also. So you have children who use their, their faces and their eyes and their eyebrows to communicate what they're feeling. The girl on the right is, um, this is definitely a communication. This is a communicative <laughs> behavior. She, this is her pouty face. And her parents know what that pouty face means. It's not something she would necessarily do when her parents were not watching. This is a communicative behavior. So how much of these things do we expect to see? How much is too much? How much? Well, it's hardly ever too much. But how much is enough? And how much is too little? <clears throat> and, it's, and it's very hard to judge. And, that, and it's a judgment call. And, and it, takes, it takes years and years. And sometimes it's still very hard. So this is an example of how subtle behavioral differences can be. They're, these are two different children around 13, 14 months. And one of them ended up with a diagnosis of autism, and one of them didn't. And what they're doing is an item on the, on the STAT, which is the screening tool for autism. And this is an imitation item. And the examiner <clears throat> is shaking a rattle and trying to get the child to shake the rattle. I mean, that's, and to pass the, this item, all you have to do is, is shake the rattle. So here's child number one. Ready? Okay, so you think she passes the item? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, all she has to do is shake the rattle. But what else she, does she do? I mean, this child is very social enga socially engaged. She's interested in the examiner as a person. She can, she's shaking it, she's banging it, and then she's looking at the examiner. Um, she responds after the examiner praises her. She's very in tune with the examiner um, and motivated. Okay, here's another child. Same item. Okay, so does she pass the item? Uh huh. She shook the rattle. But what's different about her behavior? Um, she, I, you don't have to say. <laughs> she, um, she actually, she kind of like orients herself a little bit away from the examiner. She does a lot of object exploration before she shakes it, which is okay. Typical kids do that too. Um, so, which of these two children do you, would you, you think? What are the odds that number one has autism? Raise your hand if you think that number two might. Yeah, so there, it turns out that, um, that she did. But, but I also want to emphasize that we would never, never, never make um, this judgment based on one, yeah. one little scenario like this. I, I have to say that each time. Um, this could, this be, the same behavior could occur in a perfectly, typically developing child. So it's a pattern of behaviors across situations over time um, that we use to make the the differentiation. Um, another big challenge, and this is the one that, um, that I, can I get a time check here? OK. Is, um, is the nature of our current health care delivery systems. Um, right now, our, we are operating from a diagnosis treatment model, which is a fine medical model. Uh, and it works great for, for medicine. So it goes like this. If I have concerns. My child has strep throat. I go, I get a strep test. If it's positive, or whether it's positive or negative, I get, I get the treatment. Um, the turnaround is maybe a couple of days, maybe 24 hours. It's you, you have a, a concern, you get it addressed. The diagnosis of strep doesn't take a long time, and then you get the treatment. OK, so if so, to parallel that here, this is what autism would look like. You have concerns about autism. For your child, you get a diagnostic evaluation, and then you get specialized early intervention. So it seems so very simple. And this is the system that most of us have, that many states have. 
However, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there are, um, there are some very significant roadblocks, and, and it just doesn't work for um, conditions like autism. At the first stage, there, um, there is limited knowledge of early signs. So this means that the, piece, the pri primary care providers are usually the first person to, uh, to have early and sustained contact. So we do put a lot of pressure on them. And there's not always um, the recognition of what autism looks like at very young ages. There's also, and we know this from the literature, that, that there's very limited use of autism-specific screeners, despite the fact that the, the AAP guidelines recommend it. And when screeners are used, they're often not used in exactly the way they were designed to be used, um, or um, physicians like kind of make up their own uh, measure that they use to screen, or they use it selectively, and or they use it selectively with, with, with certain children at certain times, which can lead to biases in who you're going to be able to, to, to find. So it's, we have a big barrier here even getting to the diagnostic evaluation. So if we, oh, and then if we get the referral for the evaluation, there are really long waits. How many of you know about these long waits? OK, so there are gigantic waits that can be, like a two-year-old can actually have a year-long wait for an evaluation, which is so waiting like half of their current age, which is, um, again, a very frustrating experience for parents. And as well, even if they get the diagnosis, there can be long waits due to limited availability of ASD specialized services and the providers who really know um, about autism. We did a study a couple of years ago where um, we, um, through, with the help of Parent to Parent, we surveyed parents across the state. And they were from 13 counties. And there were um, 87 of them. And we asked them questions about that included, when, is the early, when did you first suspect that your child might have autism? And when was the first time a professional recommended an autism evaluation for you? And we, had, we looked at it in three, at three age groups. And um, the youngest age group, the kid, children who are like four to 10 years old now, there was a year long wait between, or delay between that time. But prior to that, prior 10 years ago, and before that, it was over two years. And that's just this part of the process. Okay, so, um, so that's one thing that's happening. We also had, did a survey of service providers uh, across the state through, again, through the ASAP grant that we had. And we asked, um, this was a, a free response. These were open-ended questions. We asked service providers who were attending workshops um, just to write in their answers, what do you think are the obstacles to, to, for referral, for evaluation, and for intervention um, in your community? So we got for um, the things that were listed um, clumped into, and most of these were more than a third, mentioned them spontaneously without any cues. Um, that the, the primary care providers ha had limited knowledge um, or just, weren't, just were reluctant to refer a child at a young age. Um, also caregivers, they kind of wanted to know but kind of didn't want to know and were hesitant to follow through on a referral. In terms of getting to the evaluation, limited local resources and long waiting lists, as we've talked about. And then in terms of getting to the stage of autism intervention. Now, mind you, these are the interventionists who are um, providing these responses. Um, they talked about limited local resources and trained providers and, and high costs. And in a, I don't have a slide for this, but in a, in a more recent survey of 67 um, birth to three providers, um, we learned that, um, no, I think it was 87, that about 67% of them um, had, had, had had some kind of training in autism intervention, and 60% were unsatisfied with the way they are treating the children with autism in their caseload right now. These are in the birth to three system. Okay, so this is, um, so this is the situation that we have now. Some families make it up to the, up to the, up to the peak um, before three, but, but many, many do not. So what we ha are proposing and are testing, and actually got a grant to study, um, is a different kind of model that's a preventative intervention model. And instead of this model on the left that we've talked about that has the many obstacles, 
We are um, trying out a model that involves universal autism screening at 18 months during well-child visits in pediatric practices. If the screening is positive, then providing the child, sending the child to the um, birth to three system uh, program near them for an expedited assessment um, that is a second level screening combined with a parent interview and also implementing AS autism specialized intervention if that, if that is positive. They're still going to refer for a diagnostic evaluation, but it's going to get these children who either are suspected of having autism or who have it, if it just haven't been identified yet, um, it's going to get them into services earlier um, so they don't have to wait three years to get specialized services. So we call this the screen, refer, treat. We're asking um, primary care providers to screen routinely, to refer immediately for positive screens, and then um, for the birth to three system to do the, the expedited assessment and, and provide the treatment. Um, now we had, to, we had to pick certain, I'll tell you about this in a minute, we had to pick certain, um, certain tools that, that were um, amenable to use in community settings. The benefits of this model is that they can, can reduce the early disparities it, the disparities in early detection. Again, as I said, it'll give um, children some specialized intervention uh, that isn't going to hurt them, even if they don't end up having autism. And it's going to also help parents understand what's going on and give them some ideas of how to work with their child. So this is the, the study that we're doing. Lisa Ibanez, who's here tonight, is the project manager. Um, we have um, many collaborates from University of Washington from many departments. Anne Vanderstoop is here. Um, Shannon Dorsey is here. Um, we appreciate that very much. Uh, we also have many collaborators at, collaborators at the state level. They are actually all working on a grant right now that is looking at a new model for screening uh, that they're going to be submitting to HRSA, which is fantastic. Um, Department of Health, Department of Early Learning, um, the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, and then the community collaborators. And we have great community champions, and we have some of them here, too, from Skagit and Spokane, but we also have Lewis and Yakima. So what we want to do in this, um, our goal for this, is to increase universal screening by primary care providers at 18 months during well-child visits. We want to increase specialized intervention for children, um, for toddlers who have or are suspected of having autism before 24 months. We want to increase parent well-being and healthcare satisfaction during um, the time from when they become concerned and when the child starts to receive intervention. We want to improve child social communication skills. And we want to decrease disparities in screening and diagnosis. And we're focusing on speci spe specifically on Hispanic populations. So this is what the approach looks like. We want to, um, to help. The, we want to change the community practices, so through, our, through an intervention, change the practices which are then going to influence and improve parent and child outcomes. So that is the goal of this, of this grant. Um, these are the counties that we're working in. We are, um, our projected numbers are 40 primary care providers, 80 early intervention providers, um, and, and those groups will, will um, fill out questionnaires and um, complete surveys um, before we do this intervention and then after the intervention. And then we're also looking for two separate cohorts of parents, um, 280 each, who will be, um, one will be before the intervention starts in their county and, and the other group will be after the intervention's done in their county. And we're hoping that we will see differences in, in those, um, the goals that I mentioned. So this is what it looks like. Um, the healthcare system, it moves, we want a smooth transition from healthcare system to early intervention system. Healthcare, we want, um, as I mentioned, the screening for all 18 month olds at well child visits, immediate referral to birth to three, and then birth to three conducts that expedited assessment, and then we'll go on to very quickly provide a cost effective intervention that's evidence based. Um, and refer for assessment, further assessment diagnosis, and communicate back to the primary care provider, which has also been um, a challenge here. So we want to improve the flow and coordination again across different service delivery systems, which is a challenge, which many projects don't, don't try to do, but this is, um, we're making the effort to do that. 
and of course also work with the broader community. So what we're, the measures we're using and the, the tools and instruments are, we're using the, uh, the newest version of the MCHAT, which some of you may have heard of, as the screening that the primary care provider will do. We're using the screening, the STAT, the screening tool for autism plus a parent interv interview um, that the EI providers will do. And we're gonna, the intervention is reciprocal imitation training, which I'll tell you a bit about. So for the MCHAT, um, we're actually using, it's a parent report questionnaire. There are 20 questions. Um, you get a cutoff score. And we're actually having parents fill it out, not on paper, but, um, but on a, some time of tablet. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. The STAT um, has 12 different activities that measure social communication behavior. They measure interactive behaviors. Um, we're looking to see how children request, how they direct attention, how they imitate, how they play with adults. They were, and then the intervention is reciprocal imitation training, which is a, um, an ABA intervention. And it involves, it's very simple and formulaic, but very effective in eliciting children's atten social attention. And it's not a be all and end all, but it's a very um, nice intervention in which the, the parent or provider imitates what the child is doing with toys, then prompts them to do a, a new um, action with the toy. And then if, they, if a child doesn't do that after three times, they'll physically prompt the child, and then with lots and lots of praise. So there's lots of, and then they repeat the cycle of imitating the child again. So it's a very nice um, intervention that can be taught um, easily. It's inexpensive. So the, adapta the reason we chose these tools, um, the MCHAT, what we're doing for pediatric practices is um, it's one of the obstacles to the MCHAT is that there's, after the questionnaire, if, if, parent, if the child fails the screen, then you're supposed to do some follow-up questions, but that's been a deterrent because um, primary care providers just don't have the time to do that. So we're giving them um, an electronic version of it that incorporates the, the follow-up items if, if they're needed. So what the physician will get is the, the, total, the total score without having to go through that extra step. We're also give, gonna provide training in how to discuss concerns with parents, um, because I know that um, a lot of providers really are uncomfortable doing that. No, no pediatrician wants to share bad news or possible bad news with, with a parent. Um, okay, two minutes, okay. If there's anything to do. Okay, done. Okay, um, so for the expedited assessment, um, we're gonna provide support to the birth to three programs who aren't used to doing these kinds of um, more formal or more diagnostic E assessments. We're gonna um, provide um, telemedicine coaching, distance coaching to them so we can walk them through it and get them more used to it. And then reciprocal imitation training, we, we um, chose because not only can we train the birth to three providers easily to do it in a one day workshop, but they can also teach parents. And the birth to three providers here really only spend about an hour, a week or a month with children. They don't get much time. So it's important that the caregivers have, have something to do. And we're doing this through workshops, um, training workshops. And this slide, what I just want to point out is that we have lots of different measures. I didn't mention much of this, but we're asking parents lots of questions. And we're really, we're asking a lot of them because we're going to ask them stuff every three months. But we really want to follow them and their experiences through the healthcare system. Um, and we're following some who don't have concerns about autism and some who do have concerns about autism to see what their healthcare experiences are like and how, and how they're different. Um, everything is available in English and Spanish for them. So this, this is, I'm gonna finish on time. Um, so this is the goal of, the, of our, our project, is to, um, oh, I'm just gonna do it. It's just a nice visual thing. We want to move it from the current situation to here, where if parents express concerns about development, they're gonna just, they're gonna get the early intervention um, that's autism specialized that they, that they need and deserve. So, um, whoops. Lots of acknowledgments. Um, I want to acknowledge um, just many people. Thanks to Dawn and Dana for being here. Thanks to Bill Cheney for being here. Um, and the, um, this project could not be done without Lisa Ibanez, who's the project manager, and Debiana Gupta and Allison Kurop, who are, have been like just amazing in, in facing the obstacles that we have faced um, that, that David will talk about working in community settings. 
So I, that's all I, I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs>